It's a privilege and honor and blessing for me to be with you all today. I love coaches. I want to get to know you. I know some of you in the room a little bit. I don't know some of you at all, but I hope to know all of you to some extent before I leave today. But I want to share a little bit about me. You're like, well, who's this guy? Joneses. It's my family. It's my crew. It's my team. It's my wife and my three boys and my daughter. This is my first priority. We're going to talk about a little bit priorities later in the conversation, but for me, this is it. This is one of my high priorities right here. I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley. This is home since 1973. I was sharing with Joe in the back, and I was one of those guys when I graduated, I said, I'm out of here. Right? Peace out. I'm gone. Been there, done that in the valley. There's better things on planet Earth than the Rio Grande Valley. I'm going to figure out what it is and where it is, and I'm going to go. Went to Baylor four years, East Texas four years. 1997, I woke up to the fact that, no, there ain't nowhere better in the valley. I'm coming home. Came back to the Rio Grande Valley. I love the Rio Grande Valley. Blessed to have the four children that I have. They've grown up here. This is their home. I've had the privilege, honor, blessing, opportunity to speak uh, in a lot of different settings across a lot of different places, but this is my favorite because when I'm here and I'm standing with you, I'm talking to my family because just like many of you and some I've caught up with just since we've been in the room this morning, this is your home. This is where you grew up. This is where you were born. This is where you were raised. This is our family. This is our neighborhood. And so as we dive into the next couple of hours of time together, my hope and prayer is that we would grow as a family to impact the community where God has placed us. All right, talk about opportunities for just a minute. Some of y'all heard this story. You have to bear with me. Some haven't. This is going to be fresh and new for you. All right, so here, here's the story. Back in the day, some of you might have participated in something like this where you go off as an athlete you go away for some type of training camp. Leaving home, going to a new place to experience an intense two to three weeks of athletic training. Well, there was this young man who went off to football camp away from home. Man, he'd been gone for three weeks, getting pounded and drilled. He was ready to go home. Like, he was just ready to go home. I mean, he hadn't tasted mama's cooking. He hadn't seen or smelled anything remotely close to a girl. Three weeks, he was ready to go home. So camp was over. He loads up on the train. All week long, it had been brutal on his life, so much so that he was questioning, man, I don't know if God, I don't know if there is a God. Like, I don't even know if there's a God. I'm so beat up and homesick and just, I'm a mess. Well, he gets on this train, sits down in the seat. Now, this train had a bench, two seats, and it had another bench, two seats. So you had two seats and two seats facing each other. He sits down, just exhausted. Well, wouldn't you know, walking down that aisle, here she comes, and she's all that. And he's like, all right. I've been beat up all week. I'm questioning if, there, if there's a God. But God, if you're real, if you're, like, you're really up there, you're going to cause this girl to sit down right across from me. Like, if you're real. She moseys on down the aisle. She sits right across from him. He's like, there is a God. Well, walking down the aisle right behind her is this old lady. Old to him, right? The lady sits right down next to her. So it's her mama. And he's thinking, man, I got no chance now. There's no God. And then walking down the aisle, to make matters worse, is that nasty, gnarly coach who's been all up in his grill for three weeks that he was trying to get away from. Coach comes and sits down right next to him. And he's like, for sure there's no God. Like I thought I had, you know, Miss all that, and then mama sits down, and coach sits down, and man, this day's just getting worse. So he's sitting there on the train ride, going home, thinking, I can't wait to get home. I just want to get home. Train goes in this tunnel. 
it all goes dark. Kid has a thought. Now's my chance. And in the dark of the tunnel, all you hear are two sounds. It's all you hear. Kiss and a slap. It's all you hear. They come jetting out of that tunnel. Coach is shaking his head like, Ugh. here's what the girl's thinking. This is what's going through the girl's head. The girl's thinking, man, that young man, he had some guts to lean over and kiss me, but I wish my mom hadn't have slapped him. Mom is thinking, man, that punk kid leaned over. and I know he kissed my daughter, but at least she slapped him. The coach is thinking, man, I didn't know that young man on my team had so much courage. I might need to take a better look at him, but why did he slap me? And the young man is grinning ear to ear. He's thinking, there is a God, because when else and where else could I kiss a girl and slap a coach and nobody knows nothing? <laughs> Opportunity. Opportunities come in the strangest times and the strangest places. Today, today is an opportunity. Today is an opportunity for all of us. Notice I didn't say you. I didn't say y'all. Texting, right? Us. Today is an opportunity for us to grow. I'm very competitive. If my grandmother were in the room and said, let's play checkers, I'd say, you bet you're going down, woman. I am competitive. I love to compete. And I know it's early, but since I got the mic and they told me I was in charge, we're going to compete right here. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. If you're sitting down, I might call you on stage, and I'm not sure you want that. I'd like that. So, I mean, that'd be kind of cool, right? All right, here's the deal. Y'all coaches, come on, man. Get good athletic posture, good athletic stance. Now, I'm going to demonstrate, and we're going to go all in, all right? You're going to take your hands. I'm going to go on the count of three. You're going to go, I'm going to go one, two, three, go. And you're going to bring your hands together. We're going to see who can bring your hands together the fastest. Me against you. Me against you. All right? So you know, you know the instructions. Count of three. One, two, three, go. And you go like that. All right? All right. All right. So competition's real. I'm looking. Athletic stance. Get you. Now, this is not breaking fingers and dislocating joints. All right? On the count of three. One, two, three. I didn't say go. Come on now. I'm coaching. One, two, three, stop. Oh, I saw you. Yeah, I did. I saw you. All right, you got to beat me. One, two, three, and this can be go. All right, one, two, three, go. Oh, I got you that time. Because you're like, I don't know what he's up to now. One, two, three, go. All right, that was a warm up. Now you got to bring him out. Once again, this is not breaking fingers and dislocating joints. One, two, three, go. One, two, three. Oh, uh, yeah, see, you, come on now. One, two, three, go. All right, this time, when you clasp, hold them tight, like, like hold them tight. Don't let go of your hands. One, two, three, go. Hold them tight, hold them tight, hold them tight, hold them tight, hold them tight. Look down at your hands. Now, I've been checking you out, and you didn't know I was checking you out. You might have. I didn't see anybody that did, but I can't see everybody. Come on, I'm real. Look down at your thumbs. Some of you have right thumb over left thumb. Some of you have left thumb over right thumb. Hold them together. Don't let go. If you are right thumb over left thumb, let go and raise your hand. If you're right thumb over left thumb, raise your hand. All right, that means the rest of you are the other. Okay, so here's the deal. Let everybody let go. Don't sit down. Let go. Here's the deal. On the count of three, if you were right thumb over left thumb, I want you to go left over right. If you were left over right, this time you're going to go right over left. You're going to switch it up. You're going to do the opposite of what you've been doing the last seven times I put you through that drill. I'm right over left. That's my natural. I've got to go left over right on the count of three. 
One, two, three, go. All right, y'all sit down. I already got what I got, what I needed out of that. All right, how many of y'all, how many of y'all, when you did that last time, that felt weird? That felt weird, right? I'm about to make you feel even more uncomfortable. Once again, I was given the mic. I was told I was in charge, so here's how we're rolling. Everybody is going to sit in these two sections in the first 12 rows. Make a move. You got three minutes to make it happen. These two sections, first 12 rows. If you're already there, man, you just like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. Some of you are actually counting 12 rows like, I got the back row. The back row is my row. Look at you, man. Y'all so funny. I only spit occasionally. So if you're on the front, you're semi-safe. Middle two sections, first 12 rows, make it happen. Lots of empty, lots of empty, lots of people are like, and I will count 12. By golly, I will count 12. I am relentless as a coach on those teams that I lead. Here's a question every coach needs to ask and answer on a regular basis. Are you someone who can both coach and be coached? Every day we wake up, every day we draw breath and our heart beats and we hit the ground and we go out the door. As coaches, we have opportunities for both. We have opportunities to coach, to pour into, and we have opportunities to be coached, to get poured into. I love Wooden's quote. What a coach learns after think they know everything is what separates coaches, great coaches, from average coaches. You need to answer that question. Like, you really need to answer that question. What kind of coach are you? What kind of coach are you committed to? It's, and I mean really committed to. It's kind of like the, you know, the, the pig and the chicken that were in the woods one day, and the chicken looks at the pig and says, hey, let's have breakfast. The pig says, what do you want? I want... Right? What's the, what's the punchline? I want, ba I want bacon and eggs. What about you? Right? Well, the chicken just has to lay the egg the, you know, for bacon to happen. You know, the pig's got to, you know. How committed are you? How committed are you? How committed are we? How, how committed are we to really embracing this and living this out? That we are willing to both pour into and to be poured into. Well, today I applaud your administration for setting the stage for a little bit of pour into moment for your life today. And I hope you embrace both the morning, the afternoon, and other journeys along the season of your life where you've been given the blessing of someone uh, presenting something that's going to pour into you to sharpen you personally and professionally. One of my all-time heroes, Billy Graham, uh, matter of fact, his grandson, Jonathan, and I went to Baylor together, and he's one of my good friends. We text on a regular basis. This whole family is an amazing family. And Billy Graham said this, and I think he nailed it because he understood you guys. He understood uh, all of you men and women who put on the whistle and call yourself coach and the, the, the immeasurable impact that, that is rendered by a coach, not just in the life of an athlete. We've got to think beyond that. We've got to think way, way, way beyond that. It's the life of the person in front of you and everybody that they influence. Their family, their relationships, their community. This, I think he nailed it. I don't know if you've seen in your mind's eye, and some of you have. I'm not saying this is all new information. Please don't hear me say that. But some of you today perhaps will be thinking uh, in, in perhaps a different direction or, or something's going to open up in your mind that you've not thought of before about the, the tremendous relevance and the tremendous influence and impact that you have on a coach well, well beyond the, the court 
or the locker room or the weight room or the field of play or the track. And so let's just talk for just a minute. I did this last year with a, with a few of the coaches in the room, but it's, it's, it's really important, this favorite coach. How many of y'all played sports in any capacity growing up junior high through high school? How many of y'all? All right. Elementary school. How many of y'all went on and played college? I always kind of like to know. I don't know. Yeah, good, good number of y'all. How many of y'all, any, any pro athletes in the room? Anybody go on and play professionally? I never really know in the room. Okay. At whatever level, whether it's peewee, like many of us, myself included, we all play peewee all the way through whatever your last day was where you finally hung up the cleats. For me, it was college. We had a lot of coaches along the journey. Who was who your favorite coach? Just think, think, get that name, get that face, get that person in your head real quick. I'm not forcing you to have one, but a lot or many of us have, God, this, this coach, this man, this woman really is my favorite coach. Get that name in your head. See, see their face in your head for just a minute. All right, a couple of you share why. Raise your hand. It's not rhetorical. Favorite coach and why? Coach, uh, Lewis. coach who? Coach Lewis. That's fantastic. How, uh, I'm going to piggyback on that. How many of you were impacted by a coach because of the discipline that they taught, taught you? Right here. No doubt about that. Somebody else, favorite coach and why? Coach Keeling. Coach Keeling. Why? Coach Keeling, I, I've met Coach Keeling. I don't know him, obviously, like you do, but I can see that being 100% true. Taught you character, taught you about faith in the Lord. That's strong. How many of you were impacted similarly by a coach along your journey? Yeah, a few. Somebody else had a hand up. Somebody. Yeah. Work ethic, and he was your Bible school teacher. That's a strong man to have in your life. One other, somebody from this side of the room. Coach who impacted your life and why? Ken Purdy, Columbus Junction, uh, Iowa High School, went above and beyond. Uh, didn't claim to know everything. That's fantastic. We have a whole training piece uh, on not reinventing, but, but re-engaging with joy in sport. We do a whole training piece in FCA on joy in sport. Coach, you made it fun. Didn't, think, didn't act or think like you knew it all. It was just a real man. You know, we just took the time. We could keep sharing stories. And I, I've done this, y'all, I've, I've done quite a number of professional coaches training conferences um, across in Texas, across the valley, engaging with Olympic and university and federation coaches in Honduras and El Salvador. And here in September, I'm going into Cuba. And, and everywhere that I have gone, everywhere that I have engaged with coaches, whether it's uh, the, the moms and dads who are running our leagues. I've, I've done that environment. It doesn't matter if it's peewee through Olympic. When I've asked coaches that question, and I've asked every time, every audience that question, here's the answer that I never get. And y'all proved it again true today. So the track record is we're batting a thousand here. 
When I ask coaches, not kids, when I ask coaches the question, who is your favorite coach and why? Here's the answer I never get. I've never once heard anything from anybody about a win-loss record. Never once. This coach was my favorite coach because blah, 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 win-loss. Never one time. It doesn't mean that when he's not important. You're not going to ever hear me say that. I Man, I want to you know, slice somebody's throat and you know, win. You know, I'll go for the win. But it is not the most valuable asset that we as coaches bring to our athletes. It is not. It is about the impact that we have on the lives of those that come through our programs the personal touch, the personal influence. And I've shared this in a lot of coach environments. And, as I, share, and I share this with the athletes, with oftentimes coaches in the background nodding their heads up and down, like, yeah, Nathan, that's right, that's it. The great, one of the greatest wins that coaches will ever have with their athletes is not what takes place during the four years are in the program. It's, it's the five, the 10, the 15 years following when those students come back and they just cross paths in HEB and give, give Coach a big old bear hug. Thank you for the way that you poured into me when I was in your junior high volleyball program. And I'm married now and I'm doing this with my life and I've got my education, I've got a beautiful family. It, it's... It's, Coach, thank you for the way that you grew me. Thank you for the way you poured into me. Thank you for uh, the blessings I have today, Coach. I look back on my timeline, and I recognize you as being part of my DNA now and why that I'm living this life. Thank you. It's those words of gratitude. It's the, it's the victories we get to see in our kids well after they leave our programs that are the greatest victories. But for those victories to come 5, 10, 15 years down the road, we need to get dialed in today as coaches about why we coach. And I'm not saying you're not. Don't, don't, please don't hear me say that. But oftentimes, especially in a crowd this size, I, I get the pressures. Matter of fact, here's one of my coaches, Steve Stark. Some, does anybody know Steve? Does anybody remember Steve Stark? Does anybody? Yeah, one. Yeah, Steve, Coach Stark, uh, was, he came into my life when I was in junior high. Uh, one of the coaches at Sherryland. He was one of the first all-time heart-lung transplant recipients. And was, I was catching up with a uh, coach over here about, you visited Stanford during your summer vacation. Co my coach, Coach Stark, flew to Stanford, and that's where they did the deal, twice. He went through it twice, complete heart-lung transplant. And then it was uh, during my junior year in high school when, uh, the way I frame it, the Lord took him home. He passed away. And during those four years where he was a part of my life, he forever changed who I was. As I watched a man go through much hardship and continue to be faithful to his wife, to his two beautiful girls who were two of my friends, and to our football program, and to me personally. He was my FCA coach. He was one of my FCA sponsors. And he just kept pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. He'd be, tugging, he'd be tugging his oxygen tank, and he was messed up. I mean, like, he was messed up. He was in a bad way. And to the very end, to the very end, I saw what it looked like to be a man. And it forever changed my life. But I get it. How many of y'all feel like this sometimes? Like you're the little guy on the bicycle like, oh gosh. And to coach in this, this day and time, in this environment, is crazy, ridiculously hard. I, when I was introduced, I, I put it in my deal. Many coaches are some of my dearest friends. Like, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much love I have in my heart for, for coaches in general, some of you personally, 
in the profession that you have been called into and what you've chosen to do with your life. You all, coaches, have an opportunity like no other to impact the life of our modern culture of teenagers, like no other. In, in FCA, we've got a saying, two most powerful words on planet Earth. Any guesses? Two most powerful words on planet Earth? All right, I'll get to the punchline. Two most powerful words, coach said. Two most powerful words on planet Earth, coach said. It's true. My oldest son, as was alluded to in my introduction, I've got an oldest son, Jonathan, who is now a junior at Baylor, doing really well. I love him. We're close. Tremendous father-son relationship. Could not be prouder of him. Could not be more thankful to the Lord for, for the relationship that we share. But while he was in high school playing football, uh, he was a safety at Pioneer High School. It was his junior year. It was spring ball. He and I are, I mean, we're super close. Well, I go pick him up, or I go pick him up like dad's do, and he jumps in the truck, and we're, we're cruising back to the house, and he's like, dad, dad, dad. He says, you'll never believe what coach said today. And because we're close, and I know he's like, he, he sharpens me. Jonathan sharpens me. He's that kind of kid. So now I want to know what coach say, because whatever coach said that sharpened him is about to sharpen me. I'm like, Jonathan, share, man. Come on, tell me what, what coach say. And then Jonathan shared with me what coach said. Now, my first reaction was to pull over the car, put it in park, drag him out, and just kick him. You know, because I'm like, in my brain, I'm like, Jonathan, I have told you that like a thousand times. What, where you been when I've been speaking? And it took one time, coach said, true, it's true, coach said. So even in my own life, with my own son, who I'm very close with, two most powerful words on planet Earth, coach said. When coach speaks, ladies, when you speak into the lives of those females who are on your team, they are hanging on every word. I got a daughter. She's going to be a senior in high school. She's been playing athletics all her life because that's the kind of family we are. And I've been around her friends, and I've been around camp environments with a lot of uh, young ladies who come to our FCA camps. And it's amazing. You, you're in this. You already know this. But, but the trauma that so many of these young ladies are facing is horrific. At our camps, I'm thankful that year after year after year, year in, year out, for the last seven years we've been doing camp where I've been director, We've seen anywhere from 15 to 20 young ladies self-report and get the help they need from the state and from, you know, those who are in authority because of just abuse situations that are horrific. And these are the ladies that are coming through your programs. And when, they, when you speak, when you speak, and they're hanging. They're hanging on every word. And they're looking for models of what does it look like? What is, what is a a quality woman look like because they don't got nothing except you. Guys, same story. Uh, here's, a, here's a guy's story. So I'm at a camp and one of our kids from the valley is all crumpled up on the front steps and it's late at night and I'm the camp director and we got 500 athletes at this camp and it's 11.30, 11.45 and I'm doing patrol, right, because they're kids and, you know, kids do stupid stuff. So I'm patrolling, making sure everybody's where they're supposed to be. And here comes the headlights right for me. Mr. Jones, you got to get in the golf cart right now. There's a kid. we got to take you to him. Now, I don't know nothing about nothing. I just know it sounds like an emergency, so away we go. And when I get there, when I roll up on the front steps of our, our area, it's like this gazebo area. There's this 17-year-old young man sitting on the front steps, and he's just a wreck. Big strapping. I mean, he's, he's looking like he could hurt somebody, kid. I mean, kind of kids you want for a linebacker in your program or maybe a power forward on your basketball team. Or... He's just a wreck. So I roll up, and I was like, dude, what's wrong? His name's Jorge. 17 years old. He said, Mr. Jones... He says, he told me where he lived. It's just down the road from here. He said, I got nobody. 
I got nobody in my life who loves me. Mom's in jail, never seen her. Dad is in and out of jail, and when my dad gets out of jail, he, he gets me into crime with him, and he goes back to jail, and I get out. My parents don't love me. My grandmother is who I live with, but she doesn't love me either. I can be gone, Mr. Jones, for two weeks, and she never asks about me when I come home. She never says, where were you? And out of his mouth, out of this kid's mouth, and this blew me away. I've been around a lot. I've been ministering to teen, teenagers for 30 years. He says, I want somebody to tell me where to be and what to do. I want somebody to put rules over my life. That's what the kid is saying on the steps is he's just a wreck. He said, Mr. Jones, a few weeks ago, I tied a chain around my neck, went to the backyard and jumped off our swing set to hang myself. And the chain popped and I'm laying on the ground. And he said, I can't even get this right. And he was just destroyed. And so right there on the steps, I told him and led him through how to make some significant life change. And we've got these guys coming through our programs, through your track programs, through your wrestling programs. Guys, we've got guys that are rolling through your basketball and your baseball and your football and every other program. Every, everywhere a young lady or a young guy rolls through sport, they're looking for Three things. You might want to write this down. Coach Les Steckel, former NFL coach. He was the Mr. One and Done with the Vikings. Some of you might know Les Steckel. He was also our, our leader in FCA for 12, yeah, 12 years. 12 years he served as president. He said, athletes are looking for these three things. And they all begin with the letter A. Affection, attention, and affirmation. Attention, affection, and affirmation. You give any kid on planet Earth those three A's, man, they'll freaking run through a brick wall. They'll jump over the stadium for you. Attention, affirmation, and affection. What an opportunity we have as coaches to impact the lives of these young men and young ladies who come through our program who are all looking for those three A's and they got nobody. Or maybe they do have somebody who's really screwing them up and they'd be better off if they had nobody because <laughs> they got all sorts of crazy influences pulling them a hundred directions and they're all bad. But for us who have the opportunity because Coach said to model and speak words of life into them that will forever change their trajectory if we'll but answer the call. Joe Ehrman. Some of y'all, does anybody know Joe Ehrman? Does anybody know who that is? I know he's kind of older football player. Man, he, was, he was voted on by his peers, meanest man in the NFL. I mean, he was one rough dude. If you read his autobiography, you know part of his story. He grew up in a rough home to begin with, but all the more so, he got taken away as a young boy by a big group of dudes who were just bad, and he got raped as a young child. And from that, lots of bitterness, lots of hatred, lots of anger, and he grew up fighting. And he tells stories of how his dad would take him down to the basement and They'd go through boxing lessons, but there was no gloves involved. And I mean, it was just, he grew up rough. And he also grew up big. So <laughs> you take a big man full of hatred and bitterness and anger who was given the opportunity to hit somebody, uh, and they said it was okay, um, and then get paid for it. I mean, he was the meanest man in the NFL back in the 70s. He got voted that. Well, he had a significant life change along his journey. And all that bitterness went away. And then he began to realize his purpose in life was to help coaches in life to understand their purpose in life of impacting those who come through the program. And along his journey, he, he said this, and it's true. Do you know what the two things are? This is Joe Ehrman. It's about relationships and what kind of difference that I make in the lives of others. Yeah, I've, part of my MO, part of my deal, I'm a pastor. 
I've, I've had the, and I call it honor, it's a privilege to me, it's an honor to be with families um, in the room when their loved ones are passing. And I've seen firsthand, I know, I've, I've witnessed that this is true. It, when, when it all boils down, um, this, this is it. It's about relationships and what kind of difference did I make. And it's so funny, I'm no different than y'all, right? It's, Pinch me, same skin, I cut, I bleed. We're no different. We are all distracted along points in our journey to define life as being about something about getting stuff. We all are. That's part of the distraction. That's part of the temptation. It's not about stuff. It's about people. One of my mentors in life lives right here in Westlaco. Some of you might know him. His name is Ronnie Round. He's 93 years old. He lives in John Knox. Successful businessman. Been in the Valley for, I don't know, 50, 60 years. Came down as a military guy, served in Harlingen, and then rolled into business after the military and been here ever since. He's one of my mentors, lives right here in Harlingen, I mean right here in Westlaco. And if I've heard him say it once, I've heard, I've heard uh, Ronnie say it a thousand times, Nathan, what, what business are we in? Ronnie, I get it, we're in the people business. But he reminds me all the time, we're in the people business. We're in the pe- it's about people. Life is about people. So when we think about athletes, of which we've all, most all been one, I've been one, right? What, what coach wouldn't want this out of their athletes, right? Perfect effort, focus, and attitude. We want them to do the right thing, think the right thing, feel the right things, and choose the right things. I mean, it's, if we could get all of our athletes to just bring it with this, just bring it. Because I, when I coach up athletes, I say, hey, these are what you control, you control your, your effort, you control your attitude, and your focus. This is what you control, athlete. This is it. Everything else spinning around is out of your control. But every athlete can control this. And if every athlete brought their 100% best every time on all three categories here, man, who co- what coach does not want those athletes in your program, right? But we live in real world, and... How many times have we had a kid in front of us, man, we're trying to coach him up? Like, we're trying to coach him up. And they're on some other planet, right? I mean, they're like, where are you, young lady? Where are you, young sir? We live in the 21st century, and every kid's got about 100 billion things on their mind. They might be thinking about the next tweet that they get to send about the movie last night. And you're trying to teach them about, you know, the 2-3 zone. Or, I mean... I've got 14, well, I used to say I had four teenagers. My oldest just turned 20, so I ain't got four teenagers anymore. I got a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 17-year-old, and a 15-year-old, and this is their brain right here. This is them. That's probably why when Coach said it once, he got it, because Coach had his undivided, and the 3,000 times I told him, it was just like he had, like, everything going on but Dad, right? So how? How do we, how do we effectively reach today's student athlete, 21st century. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Back when I was in sports in the 80s in the Valley, I was talking with someone earlier about who my coaches were. I named a list, and they said, yeah, I know him, I know him. Coach Bucky Rodriguez, uh, Marcy De La Fuente, uh, ah, the list is long, Co- Coach Thompson, uh, Dickie Thompson, I mean, that, that was, those were men that impacted my life. And I tell you, I was a normal kid like every other knothead young man who, in case you didn't know this, the, the, the front of your brain, the frontal lobe is not fully developed until, like phys- physiologically developed until age 21, 22. And so I say every young man has frontal lobe disease, right? They don't, it's not fully developed yet. Well, I'd, I wasn't fully developed either. And so I did a lot of knothead things. And when I was screwing up, all Bucky had to do was say, hey, I'll call your dad. I straightened right up, man. I didn't want dad called because I already knew the story. Dad, it didn't matter if I was right or wrong. Dad's going to back up coach, and I get a licking at school. I get a licking at home, and we just keep rolling through life. I mean, that's just how it was. Different day. How I was coached and how many of you were coached, you already know this. The tactics have to change. Today's kids are not similar to the, where a lot of us grew up, and I know there's young ones in the crowd too, but the times are changing. Today's kids are different. 
I've been hanging out with teenagers since late 80s, ministering and being involved, and here's what I've seen. This is just an observation. What I've seen is that they are tuning out the voice, a lot of the voices that, that I used to listen to that mattered to me, voices of influence. Like, I, I really paid a lot of attention to the words of my teachers. I paid a lot of attention to my principal. I really I just respect, honor, and he said something, and I, you know, came in line. I respected my, my, my pastors. I respected other ministers along the journey. I respected my parents' friends. When another adult was over at the house and they said something, man, I just straightened up and, you know, came to task. I mean, it just... I had a lot of adult voices that I just paid attention to. I learned from and I obeyed. It was just simple. But we're living in an ever more broken society and voices that you used to and should, should still matter today, by and large, kids are tuning out and they don't care. But as we've already discussed, two most powerful words coach said. They still, coaches have the ears of students like never before, but the real journey is not to win their ears. The real journey is to win their hearts. And if we can win their hearts, man, we've got something special. And the influence and impact just escalates exponentially. So we're going to talk about a couple of pyramids. Pyramids. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of pyramids on the planet. These are Egyptian pyramids. I've never been there. One day it's on my bucket list. I'd love to go. I'd love to go stand right on top. Don't even know if that's even possible. They'd probably shoot me or something. I've been on some smaller pyramids down in Central America, but never these big jokers. I love pyramids. Well, there's a lot of pyramid models for leadership. I do business. Uh, I teach also in the business community. You can apply that. We can apply this to coach world. In the business community, here's a very typical top down leadership model. You got the leader at the top, employees underneath, customer base at the bottom. I didn't want to answer the question for you. I could have chunked up a model. It's click of a button and super easy. You tell me, in sports world, Apply this model to sports world. What do you got? Who's, who's top? Speak up. It's not rhetorical. Be bold. Go big. AD. Hey, at least we got somebody with guts. Thanks, man. So AD at the top. All right. It's common. All right, right. All right. Next, next. Level, what do we got? Coaches. I like it. That model, that model will fly. All right, so AD at the top, coaches. The bottom, who do we got? Athletes. Athletes. That's a good model. I mean, we could sit here, we could create all sorts of how this could be applied to sports models. But let's just roll with that, all right? So AD, coaches, Athletes. So you write those in your blank. This is just to get your brain juices flowing for a minute. If you're going to be in professional life, one of the common models and phraseology used behind this model is, you want to complete this sentence for me. We want to work our way to the top. We want to work our way to the top. Right? It's common. It's very common. Everybody hold up your pyramid for me so I know you got it. Hold up your pyramid for me. All right, all right. I'm looking, hold it up because I'm really looking for something. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. This is real. This is not me just trying to find out how to spend time. Thought I saw... No, change it. Okay, you can put them down. All right. Hey, come up here. She's like, oh, no, you didn't. Yeah, I did. Come up here. Come here. No, right there. Right there. No, right next to you. Yes. What's your name? What is it? 
Jennifer, come up here, Jennifer. Come on, y'all bring Jennifer up. Right here, Jennifer, stand right in the front. Thanks for volunteering. No, you didn't volunteer. Thanks for being uh, nice enough to come up when I said. All right, show them what you just showed me. This is the game changer. Take what you just wrote and turn it upside down. Right now, turn around, turn it upside down. Next level leadership, this is how it should look. As our responsibility and roles grow, we travel further towards the point which is at the bottom of the pyramid because our real job is to serve and to uphold those who are in our care. This model says I'm going to work my way to the top and everybody under me is here for me. They're here to do what I say to serve my needs because this is my deal it's all about me and my and I, and I'm at the top, and everybody under me is going to hold me up and push me higher, and I'm going to the top, and now I'm large and in charge, and this is the world's viewpoint, this is the system that many buy into, and quite honestly, many excel at. But next level leadership, when we, when we make life about people, we recognize that our posture and position is one of humility and service to help those that we have been blessed to lead to become all that they can be. And it's not about us. It's about them. It's always about them. And when we press into that, we begin to live the journey at a much deeper level of a life that matters. Because one day, one day perhaps, the young lady in your program, the young man in your program is going to be sitting in a room like this. And some joker is going to get on stage and say, hey, right now everybody close your eyes and Think about your favorite coach and why. Are they going to pull your name out of their heart? Is Nathan living a life that matters to my, to my girls' basketball spring team? I mean, I ask myself the question, when they line up one day, 10 years from now, are those girls going to say, man, that Nathan Jones, he was a nut, but golly, he just really made a difference in my life because X, Y, Z. We need to posture ourselves like this. What would it look like to put your team at the, put your kids at the top? I mean, if you really, how are you programming? And I'm not saying this isn't already where your mind and heart's at. Once again, I'm, I'm not saying that. But just like an athlete, best thing they bring, attitude, effort, focus, that's really what we control too as coaches, our attitude, effort, and focus. So this is a point of focus. This is focus moment. I mean, the kids are coming, right? When, when do they report in? Volleyball, when do they report in? Tomorrow. Football, when do they report in? August. I mean, it's, they're, boom, it's here. They're, they're about to come into the gym, ladies. Tomorrow you step into the gym my hope is this will be on your brain and in your heart. Like, man, I'm, I don't really know all the answers yet, but I know this is on my heart and my, this is on my mind and heart. I want to put them, I want to serve them. I already heard the heartbeat of your AD, and I know from our conversation, it's already in his head and heart about upholding you all. This, I'm telling you, West Laco is a special environment where much is postured and positioned for, for really good things to happen. Um, and the beautiful thing is, my, my perspective is, the leadership in the whole district is right here in this room. I, I, I tell athletes constantly, so go the athletes, so go the whole school. I mean, the athletes are the leadership of the campus. That's part of the reason I love doing what we do in FCA, walking alongside coaches and athletes, because 
Our perspective is, so go the athletes, so go the campus, but so go the coaches, so go the athletes. And so the bread and butter of leadership for the whole district, I know I'm biased, but I mean, this is right here in this room. And so special things can really culture, entire culture in Westlaco, and it's just, it's beyond the borders. And now I'm on my soapbox probably, just because I love y'all so much. Um, so go this room right here. Uh, really, so goes much, if not all, the culture in all of Westlaco. And y'all, y'all the bread and butter leaders. All right, well, let's talk about time and priorities. Minutes of sport. Let's talk about the issue of time for just a minute. Minutes of sport. Here's some of the common images of sport, right? We got game clocks, time clocks. We've got stopwatches, shot clocks. Two extra minutes, right? It may watch the World Cup. Come on. Hey, it's good stuff. My team didn't win, but it's all right. Minutes of we were in it. Minutes of sport. Oftentimes, when I'm in coach world speaking with coaches, this is this is the image, and this is not wrong. I mean, we 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 live by a lot of devices that gauge and govern the minutes that are a part of the rules and regulations of the sports we participate in. Minutes of sport. But what I want to plant some seeds and help our minds to think of is a different minutes of sport. I just took your calendar. This is your calendar, by the way. What's the co-ISD? 2018-19 calendar. It's official. There it is. Boom. Minutes of sport, 525,600 minutes. This is the number of minutes of impact per kid in your program. There's another saying we have in FCA. You know, Sports don't teach kids anything. I've been in conversations where like, man, sport, parents mainly, man, sports are great. Sports are teaching my kids discipline. Sports are teaching my kids, bless you. Sports are teaching, sports are teaching, sports are teaching. I just kind of let them ramble for a while and I just let them get it out of their system. Like, no, you're messed up. Sports aren't teaching nothing to your kid. You know, he's teaching your kid the coach. Sports are just neutral. They're generic. The coach teaches the kids. Every coach, as an athlete, on an annual basis, 525,000 minutes of potential impact. That's the minute of sports we need to get in our head and get in our heart. Yes and amen to all the game clocks and timepieces. I get it. I was in track, I was in baseball, I was in football, I was in basketball. Clocks and timepieces galore. But the minutes that my coach gave me were always more valuable than any minutes that were up on a board anywhere. The minutes of sport, get this in your head. Put this in your heart. When a kid walks in the door, there should be like a little ticker. You know, like tomorrow, Monday, right? You said they're coming in Monday. Ticker starts. 525 minutes, here we go. It's clicker, it's clicker, it's clicker, it's clicker, it's clicker. September, a few less. We're rolling into October, November. January, man, we're about in half. The real countdown ticker is the minutes that we have a potential impact over these kids. So that's one time issue we need to get in our head. The other one is Kronos versus Kairos. All right, the Greeks, pretty smart people. They had these two terms that they used when they were talking about time. English, we just say time. Greeks, they used two different terms, chronos and kairos. Chronos was the, measure, the term they used in measuring linear time. There was a beginning and an end, a start and a stop. Whether it was a a sundial way back when, or in today's terms, timepieces, whether it's calendar. We're, we are measuring time. And if you're a coach and you don't know how to measure time, you might want to find that exit sign <laughs> because if you're a coach, we, we got we to measure time right. I mean, we're, 
we're running intense practice schedules and we're on time, shh, right? I mean, you're dialed in. You, we're, I tell this story, I mean, you're always in season, right? I mean, it's, you're either preseason, season, postseason, off season, but season is 24 7, 365. The, the clock is always rolling. Kronos is always being tracked. I can go to not every coach, but a lot of coaches. I can say, hey, give me your, give me your April 17th game plan for strength training for your, for your D lineman. And they got this manual pop. They already know in spring training on this day, we got our D line doing this in the weight room. Man, they've got that calendar. I mean, they, you've, if you're going to be a next level professional coach, you have got to master Kronos. Like you got to master it. You got to be able to, to run your game clock. Any, any female basketball coaches in the, in the house? Right? Game clock management. Game clock management, Coach Kerman, that's kind of important, is it not? Game clock management. When to call a timeout, when to let it run, when to, I mean, just game clock management. We got to master these things as coaches. But if all we do is master Kronos, then we've only got half the coin. The other side of the coin is Kairos. What is kairos, you ask? Well, kairos is the term that the Greeks used to describe and define those moments in time that seem to take us out of time. Those, those, those little episodes along our journey, along our chronos, along the linear journey of time, where time just seems to stand still and stop. Case in point. I'm, what was I at this point, 20, I'm going to call it 21 years old. I'm in, yeah, I was, I was 21. I'm in uh, New York City with, um, well, now she's my wife, Kelly, but at the time she was my girlfriend and her parents and her whole family are from New York City. And so I went with her and her parents to their, well, her grandmother's house. Anyway, I'm in, I'm in their house in New York City. And I'll never forget it. I'm upstairs, a three-story deal, little, little typical New York-style home, real narrow, 15-foot wide and forever tall. And I'm on the top floor, sitting on the bed. I get a phone call. It's from my parents, Nathan. Uh, Papa died. That's my Papa. I was super close. And we'd had this whole trip mapped out. I mean... New York, then to Pennsylvania where she was born. We had this whole series of this calendar. I mean, it was all set. But sitting on that bed, I got the phone call. Papa died. I was just kind of took a step out of time for a minute. And I sat there bawling like a baby because I was really close to my Papa. And just time stood still. I can remember, well, I'll just do this because it's kind of cool, right? Center aisle. All right, so I can remember standing about like this, no, actually I was on this side, I want to get it right. About like this, when the music played, here comes the bride. There she came. My wife to be, I was hoping. I hope she's going to say yes. She hadn't done it yet. She's coming down the aisle. And just time stood still. Because I'm just thinking about her. I can remember being at Rio Grande Regional Hospital when my first son was born, Jonathan. And Doc Wilson, Doc holds him up, Nathan, look. And of course, I'm the fix it guy, right? I'm a typical dude, like, what's broken? What's wrong? How do we fix it? I'm like, I'm, I'm analyzing. He's like, no, look, no, look. I'm like, what, Doc? What? He said, look. And oh, it's a boy, you know? Like, just time stood still. I have a son. I can remember at the age of 37, being in that same hospital, different doctor, went in to get a little cyst taken out of my neck. I wake up, the, the doctor walks in the room. I don't know nothing about nothing. Right, I've been on anesthesia. How many of you have been on anesthesia before? 
And it's, it's like happy and bad all at the same time, right? And so I wake up from anesthesia. Doctor says you have cancer. I say, what? I'm a 37-year-old businessman with a wife and four kids. I came in for a little procedure. And now we're having the cancer conversation. Time stood still. Kairos is the time stand still word. It could be positive or challenging. And as a coach, we need to be mindful of Kairos moments that could possibly be happening with our team. It could be like a team environment, to Kairos moment, whether that's right after a big loss of some kind of big opportunity for the kids or whether it's a big celebration after some you know, crazy cool win. We need just to unplug the schedule for a second, right? We don't need to be barking, hey, go get your water burger. Go get on the butt. No, just kind of let the moment happen for a second. Or it could be with an individual player, maybe one of the young ladies in your program showed up at practice 15 minutes late. And if you're, if you're wired like me, and I, man, I get it because I'm, I'm forever the commander, drill sergeant, early is on time and on time is late, and where you been? I mean, I'm that guy. I'm, all four of my kids are lined out, man. And I'm, I'm the constant whip-cracking, schedule-driving. That's, that's my M.O., and I'm challenging this, but I've even got to remind myself and my own kids, hey, why are they late? Some girl rolls in 15, 30 minutes late to practice. Instead of barking, hey, run your laps. Where are you? I get that. But maybe she just came in late because she's been in the parking lot crying because she just found out her mom has breast cancer. And she could care less about your stinking practice schedule. And she's in a moment, she needs love, and she needs understanding. It doesn't mean you don't drive schedule. I'm not saying don't drive schedule. you got to get, at some point, get them back in, and, you know, we got some things to do. But have some wisdom. Maybe it's that young man that I was talking about that was all crumpled up on the steps, and he just found out that his dad got put back in jail. And so he's... Maybe he showed up on time, but he's on some other planet. Like, he's just not in practice. He's there, but he's not there. The challenge for us as coaches is to be living aware of, whether it's team or individual, the Kairos moments that might be taking place right in front of us, which could perhaps be the greatest opportunity that we have for influence and impact all year long in that kid's life. Because whether it's great, a great success they're in the middle of or a great challenge they're in the middle of, that's their moment. And how are we going to live and walk with them through that moment is what they will carry forward with them well beyond any win or loss that might take place that year. They're going to remember when I was down and out, my coach was there for me. They're going to remember when I got that scholarship, coach showed up and celebrated with me. And then the words that we speak, because coach said is the most most impactful two words on planet Earth, when coach says becomes even more relevant. Because when they were in their Kairos moment, we walked with them. Kairos versus Kronos. We got to champion both to be all that we can be as a coach. All right, on that page, on the paper I gave you, looks like a bullseye target. I want to have a discussion for just a minute, and then we're going to have an exercise of where you're actually going to write some things in your bullseye. It's a. This is going to be an exercise and a journey of creating a priority calendar as we strive to master the art of living out Kronos well and being mindful of the upside-down pyramid of those we serve. I was in a training four years ago, 
four years ago. In Dallas, my boss had put together a training for myself and the other state leaders. There was a room, about 10 of us, and he flew in a gentleman to speak to us. Um, and in, in part of that discussion, part of that training conference, we tackled the issue of time management. That was part of the training, time management. Well, we're all next level leaders. We're all coming out of uh, some seasoned years of professional life and time management. I was so appreciated my boss. Uh, Wade got up and said, um, I think with my men today, time management is not really a concern because we're all next level, hitting it and getting it and getting up early, working hard, work ethic, all that. I mean, time management is not a struggle. And there's always room to sharpen the saw. I'm not saying that, but it's not really our main struggle. But then here's what Wade said. Wade said, I think the, the, the greater concern for us as next level leaders managing time well, it's not time management, it's priority management. And as soon as he said that, it was a, just a professional spear into my heart that said, that is it. That is it. That's where I'm, I find my tension, I find my battle, I find my struggle. Because we've just got, just, we got more to do than we can get done, right, in the time we've been given. And, and, and there's just so much to get done, and, and we're working hard, and we've got a well-laid-out chronos. I mean, we've got a calendar that's just, man, we're kicking it. But it's when to put what where on the calendar. That's, that's the challenge. And that began a journey four years ago of diving into a deeper journey of really exploring how to do life better. And then as recently as this last year, even deeper still into what I'm sharing with you today. This is not rocket science. Some of you are like, man, Nathan, I knew this 10 years ago. Well, maybe you should get up here and teach because I could probably learn from you. Um, priority management. There will always be people asking us to do things that are not ours to do. Always. Always. If you're a professional of any kind worth your salt and people recognize excellence in you, you will be constantly asked to do things that are not on your plate to do. And then it's decision time. Do I or do I not? And professionals understand that the word no is a powerful word. And we need to be comfortable telling people no. But how do we tell people no? How do we tell people no when we're asked to do things? There's got to be some kind of governance and guide. And for me, I establish my priorities early. And I do not deviate from them except on rare exceptional occasion. How do we set priorities? This little formula was given to me uh, some time back. And it's been very helpful. And I just want to share it with you. This could change the way that you calendar personally and professionally. Think of that center target, the bullseye. If all, this, is, this is the, if all else fails in my life this year, but I get this right and I prioritize this one thing, then I'm going to be all right. It's not the only thing in my life, but this is the number one thing in my life. And then you start working out from your number one priority relationship. Think relationship. Think people. My number one relationship in life is right in the middle. My number two relationship in life is with this person or people group. And be thinking about those people who are the priority for you. I'll just unzip and let you see into Nathan Jones for just a second. Now, this is my world. I'm not saying this has to be your world. I'm saying it's my world, right? My world. Nathan Jones' world, center target, God. God is my number one relationship on planet Earth. And I strive, don't always get it right. I'm not perfect. Nobody in here is. But I strive pretty seriously and intensely about guarding and protecting my time. I'm talking about literally on a calendar 
my time that I spend with the Lord. Number one. In that little circle, I've got some sub, sublets, if you will. Church, my personal, I call it quiet time in my world, my personal time with God. I just don't let stuff interfere with that. I don't care what it is. I don't let it interfere. That's number one. I calendar, I physically sit down. I'm in the middle, this is my month. This is really timely. August is my month to nail down my 2018-19 priority calendar for the upcoming year because some things jostle a little bit and new dates and times and stuff. So I set my calendar. I'm right in the middle of this right now. Number two, and I'm going to expose this a little bit, so don't throw stones at me yet. Self. You think, well, that's stinking selfish. No, it's not. Self. That's what I do. I've been on an airline flight, and the stewardess gets up and does her deal that everybody now ignores because they're tired of listening to it, right? But if you pay attention, it's, we get to an altitude, there's problems, masks fall out of the ceiling. And what, is, what do you do first? When the mask falls out of the ceiling, what do you do first? Put it on yourself. And then take care of others. There are principles that I live by that come out of this that I read. about taking care of self. Not above or only, but first. And that's a different principle. Because when we don't take care of ourself, we are less valuable or no value to others. In my self category, and man, athletically probably my best days aren't in front of me. Maybe, I don't know, I'm looking at Patrick, I mean, you want to go? I don't know. But I get up in the mornings, I work out, I watch my nutrition, I have a book I'm reading, I have some Nathan Jones me time, I take care of myself, because I want to bring my most excellent value to the rings that are about to follow. And if I compromise my time with God, and I compromise myself, then the other rings that follow are going to be compromised. And the next ring is my wife. I've got on my calendar her birthday, her anniversary. I've got on there date night. And the next ring are my children. And so I calendar God, self, wife, children physically on account before I calendar anything else. And trust me, I got, a lot, I got a lot on my plate, professionally, tons. And I know you do too, because remember the little bicycle in the boxes? I mean, that's your world. That's my world. I got more than I can say grace over. And then, professionally, my, my first professional ring is sharpen the saw. Professionally, I want to be as sharp as I can be so that those who I serve will be served well. So I've got men that mentor me that I meet with once a month. I've got, professionally, I've got um, books that I read professionally to sharpen me. I've got training conferences that I've already put on the calendar. Professional sharpening, professional sharpening, professional sharpening. It's like that story about two guys who have a woodcutting contest. They both grab their axe and, and the gun goes off and they go into the woods and one guy just starts chopping, chop, 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 chop. The other dude goes off and sits on a stool with his grinding stone and just grinds his axe, grinds his axe, drinks some coffee, eat a taco. You know, about about noontime he starts cutting wood. But guy number two wins the battle because his axe was sharp. The other guy just just wanted to just just get busy, just get busy. We gotta sharpen ourselves. And so professionally, in my ring, sharpen myself. And then I start taking care of my people, professionally. I take care of my staff. In my world, I engage with donors and board members. 
and I engage with coaches. I mean, I've got people on those rings that I engage with. It's about people at that point. Because I didn't compromise my time with God. I didn't compromise my relationship with my wife or my kids, myself. I'm sharp. I'm ready for battle outside the doors. And then I go to town professionally. And these are my, these are my priorities. I'm not saying those have to be your priorities. I'm sharing with you about Nathan Jones. But I am saying setting a priority calendar will serve you well personally and professionally especially if you're a next leader go-getter who's being pulled in a hundred different ways because when opportunity presents itself to do X, Y, Z, I can just go to my calendar and say, no, I, I'd like to, but no, because that's date night. I'd like to, but no, because I'm going to be with my staff on that day. I'd like to, but no. Now, my calendar has margin. My calendar has some margin in it for the unexpected what-ifs. And on occasion, I will shuffle a thing or two that is a, an exception. But by and large, my priority calendar is set and I live by it. And it's just so helpful. What is your priorities? If you don't even know your priorities, you need to spend some time journeying on that. And I'm going to let that conversation in your head and heart start right now. Shot clock is on. We're going to take five minutes. This is not group discussion time. This is you time. Five minutes. Think tank. Things will change. We're not setting anything in stone. We're not signing anything in blood today. Just think through. This is healthy. Think through what are my priorities. Now, I know I got some, and I kind of like some of Nathan's, or I didn't, he was dumb. Or, but I got some. What are your priorities? It's a journey. It's a struggle. It's a challenge. It's an exercise. It's not easy. But it needs to be a journey that every person takes on setting your priorities and then letting that journey revelate those things in your life that need to be improved and also to revelate in our lives those things we need to let go of. I often share with people uh, this. If you show me your calendar and your pocketbook, I'll tell you what your priorities are. Where we spend our time and money it's where our priorities are. And sometimes that journey revelates things like, golly, I spent way too much time doing that. When that's about 197th on my priority calendar. Why am I spending so much time doing that? When we take an honest look at where we spend our time. When we take an honest look at where we spend our paycheck. Why am I spending X amount of dollars when... I've, I did this exercise and my poor priorities were here, 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 and here. But I'm not spending any time or money on that. And it just kind of helps to right the ship before we get too far off course. Talking about off course, part of my journey the last several years, I may mean, not look like it, but I've done a lot of marathons, halves, triathlons, Tough mutters, that sort of gig. That's just kind of how I'm wired. I'm not really great. My best finish was top quarter of my age bracket. All right, that's just kind of where I live. But I was at this one, this one um, triathlon in Bernie, Texas, called the Small Texan. And you start off in this lake swim. I didn't do any lake swimming here. I did a little bit of training. My buddy's got a place to the island. We'd jump in the bay and swim in the bay. And that was kind of creepy, I don't mind telling you. So I jump in this lake. And it was equally creepy because where we jumped in, there's this moss growing up. And I'm, I'm dragging through moss, slapping people on my right and left, getting kicked and kicking people behind me because it's this mad dash into the water. But it's really cool. And so I'm doing this deal. And I'm just, I'm, I still think I'm all pro. So I, I bury my head. My mentality is I'm burying my head. I'm going to go, man. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And so I'm in the lake, and, man, I'm just stroking it. Man, I'm stroking it. I'm stroking it. I've burned off. I'm going through my head. I've burned off miles of training swimming. And I, this is my moment. Like, this is my moment. And so I'm getting it, man. I'm getting it. And I'm leaving everybody. And, I mean, I'm just, I'm hauling. I'm like, this is PR day, man. I'm going to win this joker in my age bracket. And I'm going, and I'm going, and I'm getting it, and I'm getting it. And I bury my head. And I, I left everybody. Man, I was number one idiot. I was number one idiot. Because what I'd done, because I failed to look up, uh, I'd done this big banana curl out into the middle of the lake. 
and the safety kayak guy was just kindly paddling next to me like this joker will look up in a minute, you know, and so I never looked up, and next thing I know, I'm about, this is true, about 100 yards from the rest of the pack that was on this triangle course while I banana curled out into the middle of the lake. And <laughs> later, um, my, my wife and my kids were there watching, but they didn't know that was me. And later they said, man, geez, some dude was like way out in the middle of the lake. It's like, yeah, yeah. That happens. We get way off course when we bury our head and think we're getting it when we never look up. And so we need to push the pause button along life's journey on occasion and just take a look for the way things really are and reevaluate, reassess, get better alignment and clarity and then get back on course. And so this exercise, I encourage and challenge all of us, myself included, to do periodic, um, just get a focus, get focused on these priorities. Because what happens, at least in my world, I'll start spinning um, doing some stupid decision making on prioritizing way, way outer rings instead of circle, inner circle rings. And I can't let that happen too long or I'm way off in the middle of the lake. So anyway, thanks for doing that little journey. Hopefully, again, this is the beginning. I gave you a taste of and you just started what hopefully will be a continuation in your life of prioritizing and managing things uh, accordingly. All right, so we're back on track here. And I know that in 27 minutes, uh, we've got barbecue to put down our gullet. And that's going to be awesome. And I'm not going to stand between any of y'all and barbecue. So we will be done um, tracking on track 25 minutes. We're going to blaze through some things because, you know, lights went out. A little accelerated schedule here. I want to give some tools, put some tools in your hand that will help every one of us to be better coaches in the arenas that we serve. FCA has been given um, this tool that we call three-dimensional coaching. A uh, longtime coach, good friend of FCA, uh, definitely a friend to coaches in general. His name is Jeff Duke. Uh, Jeff was on staff. He served as a coach for many, many years, the collegiate level, the Olympic level, the high school level, he is, he is a coaching guru. He, he pioneered um, a coaching degree program that had never been developed before. I don't, you, probably many of you know this because you were in that track, or if you're younger, perhaps you got the blessings of what Jeff started years ago of having an actual degree program for coaches. But back in the day, if you want to be a coach, what did you do? Educationally, at the university level, what, what was your option Come on, tell me what was your option. I know the answer, but tell me what was your option. What's that? Teaching and phys ed. That's about, you know, that was kind of where it kind of landed. Or you could do other things like education with nothing in the world of coaching, but you just knew you wanted to be a coach, right? So you got some kind of degree and just kind of dove into coaching because you had connections and you had a heart for it that said, I want to make a difference in the lives of kids. And you just kind of dove in, but there's no real professional educational track wired and geared to help coaches become coach. Well, Jeff Duke, several years ago, pioneered at the University of Central Florida one of the first ever degree programs specifically for coaches to be professional coaches. And so Jeff, along that journey, uh, did a tremendous... I mean, he coached with Bobby Bowden. I mean, he had a long stint there at at the University of you know, Florida State. and He just has a lot of coaching in his background. Went to the University of Central Florida, developed what he called the three-dimensional coaching pyramid. And this is what I want to share with you today. Then at the very end of this, I'm going to tell you where we're going. I'm going to give you on the screen a website where you can go to and walk through an entire training program, an entire journey of professional and personal development at our FCA Coaches Academy website. But I'm going to give you a taste, hopefully wet your whistle, create some hunger, say, man, I want more of what I just saw, and then I'll, I'll coach up on how to get there. So what does the three-dimensional pyramid look like? Well, we recognize that the base of the pyramid, just think about the pyramid in three, three layers. 
base of the pyramid is the physical side of sport. Now, let's be real. If you can't coach here, you probably don't need to be coaching. If you don't know how to make your kids stronger, if you don't know how to coach in speed and quickness and technique and all, all the physical side of sport, maybe you need to look for a new profession because you've, this is where you, you need to be all pro here. Your kids are counting on you to bring out of them the best that they can be here. You got slow kids that want to get faster. You got weak kids that want to get stronger. You got kids that don't quite understand some things and you need, you need to teach them tactics. I mean, we've got to do a great job in the first dimension, the physical side of sport. That's the base. That's what gives us credibility to journey into the next level. Second dimension, the body and the mind. You got kids who have problems with motivation. You got team cohesion issues. You got kids who are emotionally all over the planet out of control. I mean, the second dimension is the mind, the mind of the athlete, helping to bring out the best in them with regards to their mental abilities. How do you do that? I mean, I've been to coaches' conferences. You've been to, you've been to way more than I've been to. But here's what I've observed, and here's what we know to be true. You, many of our coaches' conferences, you validate whether it's true or not, but I've attended. You got conferences and sessions out the gazoo with regards to first dimension. Quicker, stronger, faster, technique, all that. But where do coaches go to learn how to help the mind of an athlete to be all that it can be? Where are those conferences? Where are those clinics? There's some information out there. I'm not saying it's completely a void environment. But those offerings are few and far between. And so coaches are left to dig on our own to find information somewhere if we're even aware enough to know that, hey, I've got to go beyond the physical. I've got to help my kids' mental capacities. Third dimension. The heart of the athlete. You have any kids that struggle with, struggle with value? You got any kids who don't have a clue about their purpose in life? Kids' issues with character? They don't understand their significance on planet Earth? I mean, we got kids coming in and out of our programs whose heart is a wreck. Some know it and some don't. And we see that, right? I mean, some of our kids are aware that they're a wreck, and other kids are just a wreck, and they don't have a clue, and they don't care, but who's the big person in the room? That's what I say. Who, we're, we're the ones that are supposed to be the adult in the environment, carrying our kids forward and upward, recognizing in them where the weaknesses are, where their challenges are, and then coaching them forward. Oftentimes, in coach world, we can, we can recognize physical weaknesses and fallacies and detriments real quick. And we're, we've, we quickly game plan towards a success game plan on how to make that athlete individually and teams corporately to track upwards and forwards physically so we can get the W. But when we make our coaching journey about people and not the win-loss column, and I'm, once again, I'm not downplaying winning. I'm all, yes, and amen to winning. I love to win. But if that's the center of your target, you're missing it. The center of our target is the young man and the young lady standing in front of us who we're only going to have for a short season of their life, who have been entrusted to us to influence and impact so that when they leave our programs and they leave our school systems and they move forward through their life, We've done something of greater value than a win-loss. We've done something more precious than making them strong and fast and quick. We've built into them, into their mind, into their heart, the things that will carry them forward so that they can be all that they were created to be and do all that they can do. And they're in our care for this short season. Yes, it's 525, 600 minutes a year. Times four, if you've got four-year program, junior high, two or three years, it's a million to two million minutes, and that seems like, well, that's a big number. But it's a short season. 
compared to the rest of their life. And so we as coaches need to dial it in and always be thinking, how do I reach the mind and the heart of our athletes? This is three-dimensional coaching. This is, this is what we journey through in our three-dimensional coaching program. How do we reach? Yes, I mean, I could, raise, I could ask for a show of hands. Show me if you want to reach the heart and the mind of your coach, and hands would pop up. I get that. But then the real critical question comes, okay, well, how? Okay, yes, Nathan, we agree philosophically. Yes, yes, I want to be a coach who thinks about my player above the win-loss. Yes, but how, Nathan? How do I do this? How do I practically implement this into my program? How do I practically live this out in my practices? How do we, how do we interject this in game day? It begins with getting a vision of what your program could look like. One of the dimensions that we, that we talk about, I'm just going to give you a taste of one of the eight that are in the mind category. All right, so if you, if you decide, hey, I want to know more about this whole three-dimensional coaching model, like I said, I'm going to give you a website. You can get online, self-pace your way through the material. There's modules to go through with training pieces and videos. and It's awesome. Let me tell you, when I first went through it, game changer on Nathan Jones on the way that I love my wife the way I related to my children, the way I was with my coworkers, my friendships. It was a professional and personal moment of, of accelerated growth for me. The material is that good. So let me give you a taste. All right, so let's say we're in the, the model of emotions. What, what are we going to learn here? I'll give you a little taste. All right, so what are emotions? It's the heart's response to one's performance. How, how does the heart respond to Performance. What, what, what emotions do you see in your athletes that give you some kind of indicator about what they might be feeling inside their heart? What do you see? Not rhetorical. Give me an answer. Frustration. Frustration. There's an emotion. Smiles. What's that? Smiles. Smiles. Smiles and outward evidence of an inward reality of happiness. Happiness we talked about earlier. Somebody said, my coach, he just we learned how to be happy when we played. Frustration, happiness. What else? What are the emotions? Stress. Stress. What's that? Excitement, somebody said? Excitement. Excitement. Anger. Fear. So we've got pot. We can keep going and on and on and on. We've got positive emotions. We've got and we got negative emotions. Now, here's some effects physiologically, psychologically, and in your behavior. You've been in an athletic situation and somebody's crying. You know, I always go back to the Tom Hanks movie, right? You already know it. There's no crying in baseball, you know? Well, you can say that all you want, but crying's gonna happen. Crying can be good. Or bad. It can be on either side of the coin, but we see this is one of the evidences here. What up? Psychologically, loss of focus. Kids get emotional, whether it's happy or angry, and all of a sudden their focus on their assignment is out the door. Like they're gone. Like they're next play, they're about to get run over. Behavior. Weeping, talkative, throw a towel, throw a chair, throw a helmet, throw something. So you got pleasant and unpleasant emotions. Here's just, these are examples, completely not an exhaustive list. Here's some counterintuitive truths. Positive emotions don't always mean that it's going to improve your performance. And negative emotions aren't always bad. You might want to jot this little matrix down. Write this on your paper. It's all online. You can look it on the website, but for those who are just, you know, note-taking people, there you go. This is worth jotting down. Unpleasant versus pleasant emotions, helpful versus harmful. What's an example of an unpleasant emotion that could be helpful? What do you think? What's an unpleasant emotion that could be helpful? What's that? Okay. 
pain, training. through training. What's the emotion behind the failure? Fear. fear. I've done some really positive things in sport out of fear. I was a wide receiver in high school and through college. I did not want to get nailed by a couple of those big guys. Ran for fear of my life when I had the ball. Positive traction down the field. Not all fear is bad. Anger. Not all anger is bad. I mean, I also played a little bit outside linebacker, and sometimes a little healthy anger helps you to perform to a level. Not all bad, or not all negative emotions are bad. Some are helpful. But what's an example of negative emotions that are harmful? What would that look like? Frustration, what does that do? Somebody, who said that, frustration? Frustration? Yeah, what is that, what is, how can frustration be harmful? Lose focus. So you get it. I mean, you get, we could go on and on, but you get it. As coach, we need to be aware, if we're next level, if we're, we're really striving to be a three-dimensional coach, if we're trying to tune into our athletes, not in order to get them to do something, although that's part of the journey, but that's not the end game. The end game is to help them to be all they can be and do all they can do. But in the helping them to be all they can be, if we're dialed into paying attention to the emotions of our athletes, we can coach them through, not just to improve their sport, but to help them become better people in life. Now back to the example I used earlier. Hey, if I, if I asked a coach, give me your April 17th game plan of you know, what your D linemen are going to be doing in the weight room, they could probably, some, not all, I get it, some are not that detailed, but some could flip in their three-ring binder to that date and say, yeah, on that date, we're doing this in the weight room. And we could do that for any sport, pre-season, post, off-season, all-season, 24-7. Some people are very detailed. And even if you're not that detailed, I can just say, hey, tell me, in, tell me in August, what are you doing with your team? And you got some kind of plan, and most plans in, are, are pretty weighted on, here's my plan for first-dimensional activity. But if I went to that same coach and said, hey, give me your game plan for you know, the first week in May, how are you going to build the emotional capacity of your offensive line? They say, say what? Build the emotional capacity? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, coach, tell me, how, how are you work, what's your motivational game plan for the month of October? I know a lot of you are teachers, right? You got a teacher, my, my wife's a school teacher also. You, know, you got lesson plans. You know, we, we want a game plan to the nth degree in our first dimension. And that's where we're weighted, probably because of two things. Whether we want to own it or not, we, we really want the W. Really, really, like really, really, really bad. Like really bad. And programming out in the first dimension is going to get us the dub. And so that's one reason we go there most of the time. The other is we've never really studied and sharpened ourselves so that we understand how to game plan to the same intensity, to the same detail with regards to helping our athletes, with regards to developing their mind and developing their heart. Just don't know how. And that's fair. That, that, that is a fair reason. And so back to three-dimensional coaching, if you will journey through this, you will sharpen your blade on how to bring the same intensity and detail into your game planning in building your athletes, one athlete at a time, as well as team, with regards to their mind and their heart. 
Here's some pleasant, helpful examples. Here's some pleasant, harmful examples. Here's some unpleasant, helpful examples. <clears throat> and some unpleasant, harmful. These are just examples. I'm giving you tastes of stuff that you'll go through in the training. For those who have phones, you can feel free to pull them out. I see some of you doing that. Pull them out. Take a picture of this screen if you're so inclined to do that. Then you just question these, ponder these questions later. What are the results? Well, again, I'm not making this up. I'm not pulling this out of a hat. Jeff Duke has done over a decade of research behind coaches who utilize this material, and these are just the black and white results from his research. All right, there's, there's the websites. Let's get to that because I want to honor our time. The one at the bottom, fcacoachesacademy.com, that is where you can go and do your own self-paced journey through the three-dimensional material. I mean, I'm literally, folks, I, I touched on maybe 2% of what's on the website. It is thorough. It, it helps coaches with regards to writing purpose statements, to diving into all three dimensions. It's, it's an excellent, excellent journey. I highly recommend it. It's free. It's all free. There is another journey that's you can pay for. And if, if any of you are at some point, Wesley Co. is saying, hey, here's, you're on your own to get some CE credits. We have a certified course for CE credits and even for those who need college credits. And there's a whole other blown up program offering uh, this for pay, but this is, I'm giving you the free stuff, and it is just as in-depth. All right, last, last word. I got two minutes. Last word. Right now, I want you to write down one thing. What's your one, I'm a big one thing guy. What's your one takeaway from today? I mean, you just like drinking out of a fire hydrant, right? But write down one thing. Because information without application and implementation is a waste of time. i got to believe there's one thing. There might be more than one. If you are, go team. But one thing that you've been challenged by today, say, I need to do this better at home. I need to do this better at work. This is my, I'm going to make some traction. I'm going to improve. My game is going to change. Here's my one thing. Part of what you'll, and I'll just give you a little nugget here too, part of what you'll be exposed to when you get into the website, three, uh, the Coaches Academy website, go through the three-dimensional coaching, is a whole conversation, a part of that training, a conversation about uh, great to good. Well, you're thinking, man, I, aren't we supposed to go good to great? Let me just, just a minute. Great to good. If you think in this term, great matters, I mean, great measures accomplishment. And I'm not knocking great. I'm really not. I was a part of some great teams. Great measures accomplishment. Good measures person. And we want both in our programs. Good measures the quality of a person's life. It's too often in sport we're consumed by great. Trophies, awards, write-ups, accomplishments, and good often gets sacrificed. Oftentimes, the players who come through our programs, that's what they pick up on. And they walk away wired to do life great. And their whole journey of learning what it is to be good has been little to nothing. And my challenge for all of us in this room, because we we are the ones 
who are the thermometer, I mean, are the thermostat for our culture. We set the bar. It's on us. If not us, then who? If not this, then what? If not now, then when? You know, those are three great questions. It's on us to be the ones who change and set the bar for our culture that we live in right here. This is home. Westlaco, Rio Grande Valley, this is our home. And we can literally change an entire culture when our mind, when it starts with us, our mind and hearts are right and we stay focused on the right things and we make the determined, intentional decision to be right and do right by those that have been given to us as a privilege to lead. I love coaches. I love you all, and I'm super grateful for all that you do, giving up hours and working the tireless jobs you have and all of that. I love coaches. FCA loves coaches. We believe in you, and we're here to serve you. It's been my honor to be with you today.